much for getting up this early to join us for this latest playbook breakfast with the European Commission Vice President for Energy Union, Maros Shevkovic. Uh, I'm so glad we're starting on time. That's a rare thing for a Brussels event, and we're going to make it a very good morning for you. For anyone who hasn't met me, my name's Ryan Heath. I write the Brussels playbook column for Politico, and I'm conducting the interview today with Mr. Shevkovic. Uh, I wanted to go through a few housekeeping remarks to make sure we all are participating as much as possible and are on the same page. So first thing you need to know is we're being live streamed today, so we might get some questions coming in online and the cameras might pan across you at some point, but that's great because it means we're not just 200 people here in the room, but we might be, in fact, several thousand participating in this event. So a bit of a stadium moment. And of course, I can't go any further without thanking our partner, Iberdrola, who uh, are sponsoring this event, and they're making this great venue and this great discussion possible. So thank you for making that possible. Now, if you want to participate, there are two ways that you can make a point, ask a question. You can do it on Twitter using the tag Playbook Breakfast. And so we will see that up on the screens, and people can see what you're thinking about the vice president's answers. Or you can use a system called Slido, so you can get it from a website. They also have an app. But if you put into your phones sli.do, and then you enter in the password, hashtag pbsefkovic, the same one that was given to you on the little slip on arrival, if you followed instructions, um, then you can post questions there. We'll see them on a little screen in front of us, and people have the chance to say which question they really want to uh, hear asked and answered, and th those will rise to the top, and we'll get through as many as possible. And that way we don't waste time passing the microphone around to different people, and we get through more of your questions. And as I do every time I get up on this stage, I want to remind you that we have evaluation forms because we want to be as audience-driven as possible. So if there's something that you really like about this event, if there's something where you think, just don't do it again, please, put it down on that form, uh, pop it into the box on the way out, and we will do our best to keep improving the events for next time. Without further ado, I want to invite up onto the stage Ignacio Galan, who is the CEO and chairman of Iberdrola for a few welcome remarks. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. So, good morning, Mr. Vice President Sekovic, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, everybody. It's a great pleasure for me to open this breakfast as a, and present to Honorable Maro Sekovic, Vice President of the European Commission and in charge of the Energy Union. Vice President Sekovic is a firm believer of a united Europe. In fact, I will say that over the last decades, few have demonstrated a stronger and more passionate commitment in the, to the European Union. He became a doctor in law at the Comenius University of Bratislava and joined the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Czech and Slovak Republic a few months after the nomination of Barca Havel as president. From this position, he played an active role in the impressive transition process that followed, including the creation of the state of the Slovak Republic. He was then a key actor in the accession process to Slovakia to the European Union as deputy head of mission in Brussels in 1998, and five years later in the other position as such as ambassador to Israel, was nominated director general of European Affairs and afterwards a Slovak permanent representative in Europe in European Union. His reputation as a man with an outstanding capacity to build up consensus was without a doubt one of the reasons that led to him designation as European Commissioner, with portfolios as essential for the future of Europe as education, training, culture, and youth, and interinstitutional relations. Through, through his uh, distinguished career, Mano Sekovic has always worked towards a union that best served to the interests and aspiration of the people of Europe. And since 2014, he is leading one of the key building blocks of this common project, the Energy Union. A union that aims at providing affordable, secure, and sustainable energy for all Europeans, promoting at the same time a more efficient use of resources and creating incentives for investment in research and innovation. Only three years later, the list of legislative and non-legislative initiatives led by, the, by President Sekovic and Commissioner Canete is really impressive, to name just a few. The Clean Energy for All European Package, 
currently under analysis by the Parliament and the Council, which lays the foundation for a transition toward a new energy model based on security, sustainability, and competitiveness. The ongoing reform of the Emission Trading System Directive aimed at reaffirming Europe's leadership position in decarbonization by improving the design of the carbon market and creating long-term signals to incentive investment in low-carbon technologies. And finally, the Clean Mobility Package, a comprehensive set of proposals toward a cleaner transport sector in Europe published last week. Much has been done by the European Commission over the last few years, but as I had chance to say earlier this week in the Clamate Summit of Bonn, now is the time for action. Only joining forces, we will be able to secure sustainable and competitive energy for all Europeans. The electricity sector, which account only 25% of the global emission, can make very relevant contribution through more renewable energies, more smart networks, and expanding storage capacity, as well as increasing customer engagement through more digitalization and energy efficiency. This has been the pillars of Iberdrola, my company, strategy for the last 17 years, during which we have invested more than 90 billion euros in clean energies and networks, and we have, about, we have already shut down 15 coal and oil plants, which total close to 8,000 megawatts of capacity. This has allowed us to reduce our specific emission in Europe by 75% compared with the year 2000, reaching level which is 67% below our European peers. But we want to go further. This is why we have set the target of reducing our emission by 50% again by 2030 compared with 2007 levels. To achieve this, we plan to complete the, to complete the shutdown of all our last two coal power plants and continue investing in the range of five to six billion euros per annum in renewable energy storage and networks. These plans are fully in line with the Commission strategy vision energy led by President Sekovic. We support the proposal for a limit on emission to receive capacity mechanism, ensuring the supply is secure uh, through the carbon sources. We, and we advance for the ambitious binding renewable share, even reaching 35% by 2030, which can be achieved through increased electrification of transport. The Energy Union project will always find the support and collaboration of Fiber Dollar. In my 17-year job, longer than any other CEO in the, in the sector in this moment, have never seen a set of reforms as ambitious as those ones proposed in 2014 by President Sekovic. Let me finish by encouraging him to continue working with all the institutions so that this magnificent job is finally approved and fully implemented by member states. It's time for urgent action, and we want to comply with 2030 targets and make our energy system more resilient, competitive, and sustainable to benefit of all Europeans. Thank you very much. Thank you. If I invite you onto the stage, Vice President Sefcovic. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> we can do the handshake afterwards. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> so I was, when I was planning this event, sir, I was uh, thinking, OK, we'll get started on COP23. Uh, That's the obvious place to start. And I was wrong because I was reminded during the introductions of your very impressive CV and how you started your career as a diplomat in Zimbabwe. And they've got some trouble right now. So Robert Mugabe has been president in Zimbabwe for so long that Mr. Sefcovic started his diplomatic career um, and Mr. Mugabe was still the president. Have you got any thoughts on what's going on there? How are you feeling about What's yeah, happening in Zimbabwe? It's really a, a mixed uh, feeling because it was my first diplomatic posting. My daughter was born there, so I have long-lasting souvenir uh, from from <laughs> yeah. from Zimbabwe and, and pretty good one. And uh, uh, and uh, of course, we have still a lot of photos and a lot of fond memories on on Zimbabwe. And at that time, you would be very much surprised. I still remember the exchange rate when the one US dollar was traded for three. Later on, for five Zimbabwean dollars, later on it was moved into the millions. Zimbabwe at that time was still the country which was like breadbasket for the whole South Africa and where the farmers could harvest uh, 
they feel it's, uh, three times a year. Mm -hmm. Now you read about Zimbabwe, the country where is hunger, where is unbelievable poverty, where you have this uh, interracial and interethnic hatred, which I didn't encounter at all mm -hmm. when, I, when I was there. So what I want to say is that nobody would miss Mr. Mugabe, nobody would miss uh, his uh, dictat uh, dictatorship in that country. But of course, all of us are hoping and watching carefully that we could avoid bloodshed violence because I think that uh, this particular country and this uh, continent uh, were through, through a lot. So I, I just would wish uh, Zimbabweans, because they're fantastic people, good government, good leader, uh, strong reforms, and, and making it back uh, to the prosperity which this country really has a potential for. Great. I promise to get back on topic now. <laughs> so COP23, we've seen the leaders' speeches now in Bonn. It's been going on for a week, and it's, it's about to wrap up. Uh, what, what's your takeaway? Uh, is the world doing enough in the aftermath of Paris? And what about China? Is it OK that they keep classifying themselves as a developing country and uh, maybe aren't lifting as much as we thought they were going to? I think that from, from one side, it's always uh, very uplifting, I would say, to attend uh, this uh, climate conferences because you feel that positive energy from, from, from all participants. And, and if you had any doubt if the, if the people from the Fiji put on you the virtual reality mask, mm -hmm. and you can really see what's happening on the island, how the water is rising, how the people are losing their, their houses, you, you, you understand that here we are not dealing with some kind of theoretical threat, but these people are directly affected. They, they lost uh, their homes. They're afraid that they would lose the island. So it, it gives you that, uh, I would say, additional push you need to, uh, uh, to be very conscious about the importance of the things uh, uh, we do together. At the same time, uh, I think that all of us would agree immediately that we are not doing enough. Mm -hmm. Because uh, in all the scenarios, it's quite clear that we, uh, we will have to do more to keep the temperature rising and stay below the two degrees uh, Celsius. And I think one of the most impassioned speeches there, uh, Gar Governor of California said that, you know, guys, but remember, we will have to go then to the negative. We will have to learn how to actually remove later on uh, the, the, the CO2 from, from the atmosphere. So we are quite a, far from, from that. But what is, I think, very important is to keep up the deal from Paris, to keep the trajectory, and, and, and really, I would say, to preserve the spirit and the philosophy mm -hmm. which uh, helped us to arrive at the Paris Agreement. So, uh, uh, therefore, that, I would say, latest move where we would like to um, get to the old logic to have this super differentiated uh, approach to again dwell on this bifurcation and all these things. I think it could delay us uh, from the from the result, uh, and I think this is a bit of a unfortunate uh, uh, a payment we have to do for Americans leaving the table mm -hmm. because they kind of uh, reopen some of the old wounds, some some of the. Uh, all the debates. So therefore, I think that the debate which is in, in Bonn uh, is so important, and therefore, I think that one planet summit in Paris would be crucial because we, of course, have to reassure our, our friends in, in the developing world that we developed, we are ready to do more, that we are ready to bring more investment, more technologies, that we, that we, that we understand uh, uh, the, the, the pressures uh, they are under. But at the same time, if we must preserve the spirit of Paris. We have to have a good facilitative dialogue in 2018 because it would be for the first time where we would actually learn uh, how are we doing, what are the precise number, uh, what are the measurements, and, and therefore I think that uh, now the role of uh, Europe, the role of European diplomacy would be even more and more important because if it, if it comes to the preservation of the uh, spirit of Paris, it's, it's very much the Europeans, it's very much the, the, the Canadians, and of course we will work very, very closely with our Chinese partners to make sure that we will deliver because it's as important for them as it is important for us. Well, thinking back to that spirit of Paris, so I get the defensive point that you want to preserve what happened there, but one of the things that always struck me about Paris was the really uh, heavy involvement of non-government actors, often the private sector. And listening to Mr. Galan's speech and everything Iberdrola is doing there, it really strikes me that private investment might be a bit of the way around uh, blockages, whether it's at China, the US, or another level. And I know that when you did your uh, last State of the Energy Union report, you talked about green investment platforms. How close are we to seeing those money? Tell us a bit more yeah. about those platforms. Is that the way to, to make sure we're not blindsided by China or the US? I, I think it's, it's definitely part of the answers, but I'm very glad that you, that you referred to, to Mr. Uh, Mr. Galan because we need such an 
industrial enlightened leaders like, like his. And I'm very glad that we see more and more of them in Europe, but, and what is especially important, in the United States. Because there, you saw that the statement of the White House on withdrawal from the Paris actually mobilized the states like California, but, but many others. The, the cities where uh, they are working very intensely with us under the global covenant of uh, mayors and where Mike Bloomberg is really uh, playing that role of getting all the, the mayors together to support the fight against climate change. But I would say equally important is involvement of, uh, of the big companies, on the industrial leaders, of the business leaders who realize that uh, going clean, going green, going sustainable, it's a part of their reputation. And if you want to really have an international company with a strong reputation, you, you have to be very strong in this aspect as well. And th therefore, I believe that if we put the, the proper legal framework, mm -hmm. but also we would charter that uh, vision where we want to go from now until 2030 and later on to carbon neutral second part of the, of the century, the business leaders uh, will help us because they feel that the corporate social responsibility, mm -hmm. but also because increasingly they see the business sense in using these new technologies and, and, um, and uh, this uh, revenue, the investment in that area would bring back. But coming back to the uh, investment platforms, I think that uh, in coming days we are working very hard to make several announcements. One is to really uh, already kick off uh, the smart financing for, for smart, uh, smart platform thing. The, uh, I believe that we did our, our bit and now we are uh, working very closely with the European Investment Bank to get the, the whole thing moving, to put the, the financial mass of the EIB into the operation. And what sort of numbers are we talking about? I think we are definitely talking, uh, talking the billions, but uh, why I am not that hundred precise on this one, because it would very much depend on how um, uh, the, the money which we would put to this, the risking loan guarantees would be matched by, uh, let's say, EU funds, which have been mm -hmm. already allocated to the member states, or by additional uh, funding by the promotional banks mm -hmm. from, the, from the member states. And to quote uh, my colleague, Vice President from, uh, from the EIB, Mr. McDowell, who said in the European Parliament, money is not a problem. We need a good project. And I have to say I agree with him. So Brexit isn't going to be a problem <laughs> for financing things like this I mean, in the future? You know, we approved uh, uh, this, uh, it's a bit technical, but uh, it, it's quite important, energy performance uh, contracts and, and, and the fact that, uh, if I simplify a little bit, uh, they shouldn't be accounted uh, uh, under, the, under the public deficit. So this is really untying the hands of many mayors and the ministers of finance are now much more supportive to see the money flowing into the investment, into the energy efficiency. So, so I hope that uh, this would bring us much more money coming into that direction. And the problem really is, and this is what we discussed with the EIB, that for them the limit of the loan to be discussed must be over 20 million euros. And every mayor from, from I would say, medium-sized country will tell you that simply this is too high. So we are talking to them how this could be lowered or how they can help us to aggregate the project, that this is not actually the stumbling block. And therefore, I, I am pleading uh, with uh, all my colleagues in the member states that we would need investment platforms in all our um, uh, member states uh, where the European Investment Bank and the Commission would be able to, to give the you know, tailor-made advice, where we will be able to tell them how to de-risk these loans and how to work with the mayors on the concrete project. Yeah. And, and will and that require any legislation, or you're able to just no, go No, I think we already did most of it be, through, yeah. the, through the latest omnibus, so mm -hmm. uh, maybe we just really have to wait for the final work on the EIB. They promised us it will be before Christmas, mm -hmm. and th then I hope that as of the next year we can really start to use this uh, new instrument. And another very important thing, I would say linked a little bit with Paris and with... Uh, uh, with Bonn would be also our work, which, which I hope we would complete, uh, where we would like to announce the external investment fund, uh, which would be aimed mostly for Africa. Okay. We would like to learn... We could be getting into Zimbabwe. Exactly. Like the best news that they've had in a <laughs> while. Uh, because uh, we would like to learn from the experiences of Juncker Investment Fund and use the same principles, but now mostly uh, from, from Africa. How can we leverage, how can we bring uh, development aid promotional banks to, to help us to actually uh, get, I hope, uh, dozens of billions of euros to support the sustainable and clean energy projects uh, on African continent. And finally, give to 600, 700 million of people living in Africa the basis access, basic access to, to electricity. Great. Now, 
On to a tricky geopolitical issue. I wanted to ask you about Nord Stream 2 and where we're at there. Um, you know, you've sat and negotiated with the Russian government before. So where are we on the project and what, what is it like actually dealing with those guys? I think that uh, uh, the last meeting with uh, our Russian partners we had, I think, in the, in, in the first uh, semester, we wanted uh, to meet uh, after summer break just to take the stock uh, uh, where, where we are, mostly um, uh, to deal with, uh, I would say, the general uh, questions linked with the, with the infrastructure, because I think I was uh, very honest uh, uh, with them and also with the uh, uh, European uh, energy ministers, because if you look, what would be, um, I would say, the need uh, for gas in 2030, and I know that there is a dispute between the NGO sector, uh, the European Commission uh, modelers, mm -hmm. and uh, of course the gas industry, so I take very 13, safe... The, there the, are 13 countries the, that have the, the, the middle road that we would need around 400 billion cubic meters of gas in 20, yeah. 2030. And then we put all the projects on the table, which are planned or talked about in the press, or which we have found somewhere that somebody is proposing it to somebody. And we ended up uh, uh, with a figure of 900 billion cubic meters. So I know that not all of that would be materialized and would be built. But if they're actually uh, building the, the capacity uh, 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 which is twice as big as we really need, so there is huge risk of stranded assets. There is a huge risk of the, of the big investment which would be made uh, into this uh, overcapacity, which would not need in the end. And I think that we need very rational debate uh, about this within, I would say, our energy community in Europe, but also with, uh, with uh, our uh, partners, uh, with, uh, uh, with the importers of uh, these commodities uh, uh, to Europe. And speaking about the, the Nord Stream, you know that... Uh, this uh, discussion is uh, very sensitive, it's politically charged. I often say that I haven't seen um, any commercial project to be so passionately debated on the highest levels of the European politics at several European councils. I never received so many letters from the, from the prime ministers on, on, on the project. So simply, that's the project which has uh, uh, very uh, strategic importance. Mm -hmm. And for many countries, this is uh, politically extremely sensitive. Therefore, what we uh, proposed was uh, let's let's took all this on the table, all the concerns, all the worries uh, the member states uh, have, all that uh, feeling uh, that we have to be very fair, especially to those countries who until today are paying more for the gas and the mm -hmm. Western partners, despite the fact that geographically they are closer, closer to the source of gas. And of course, let's respect our strategic priority, which is uh, to help Ukraine and to preserve the gas transit through this country in uh, post-2019 period. And uh, the only thing how we can deal with all these issues would be through negotiations. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we requested the mandate from the, uh, from the member states and uh, the discussion was very much slowed down by the different perception how comprehensively the EU law mm -hmm. is covering, especially the part uh, basically of external Germany pipeline. would like to do this on their own. No, it? not not only only them. There are some other countries uh, 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 which uh, have been interested uh, in that, and therefore we propose that okay, if this is the only one issue, one stumbling block, so let's let's clarify this question. Let's give. Uh, to everyone, legal certainty, legal clarity, and making sure that any pipeline which is under the uh, jurisdiction of the European Union simply would have to respect fully the, the European law. And if you have the collision of legal regimes, mm -hmm. which would be the case uh, of the Nord Stream, because, uh, uh, because it will be the Russian jurisdiction, international law on the seas, and the European jurisdiction, so let's negotiate. But the point being, whether it's Nord Stream, South Stream, Turk Stream, whatever stream, I mean, e yeah, every, everywhere, way. everywhere, when, when uh, the pipeline is under EU jurisdictions, we want to have the same uh, application of the, of the European law, because I think that would be transparent, it would be legally clear, and uh, everybody would know under what conditions they're coming to Europe. Mm -hmm. Now, we'll get onto your massive set of legislative files in a second. I think it's time maybe to go to a couple of questions from the audience. The first one comes from Bayouk, the consumer rights organization, and they ask, Current proposals on energy have focused only on the electricity market. Will consumers end up with different rights in gas and in electricity markets? Yeah, I mean, here I think we, we, we might have a slightly different uh, perception because uh, when we presented the energy union and its five dimensions, the first one, which was, I would say, the most vivid uh, for the European 
uh, leaders in 2014 was the energy security. So actually the, the first uh, batch of legislative proposals been very much uh, linked uh, with, uh, with the gas sectors. We've been introducing the transparency for intergovernmental agreements. Uh, we've been pushing for more tra transparency for the commercial contracts. We wanted to make sure that uh, intergovernmental agreements in this field uh, would be checked by the European Commission, that they are compliant with the EU law meaning that nobody could be, I would say, pushed into the corner and, and pressured uh, and signed something which is not 100% in line uh, with, uh, with the European um, legal, legal framework. So we, we did uh, quite a lot uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the increased uh, energy security and much better interconnection between the member states in uh, the EU. We simply want to give EU, uh, every EU member state uh, the access to at least three different sources of gas. Mm -hmm. Because in that case, they have a choice, they have a guarantee that if one supplier is, let's say, not supplying or interrupting the supply, you can still have two different options where to get the gas so nobody would have to freeze in the winters as we had to do in 2000, 2009. And if it comes to the, to the uh, co consumer rights, uh, uh, for us, if it comes to the energy and, and consumer rights, we, we do not see any, any difference. So we really want to beef up uh, also the, I would say, the awareness of, uh, of the rights of the consumers, better work on the consumers' associations. And if uh, our colleagues from Biug would see any flaws or shortcomings in um, how the consumers are protected in this particular segment, I think it would be very good to know because uh, so far we've been faced mostly with uh, uh, the, the lack of uh, information spread about how to make sure that I know how to select the good supplier, especially for, uh, uh, for electricity. So if you can do something more for the consumers of gas in Europe, definitely we are ready to do so. Great. Um, now, I wanted to ask you about the mobility package that was approved last week through the Commission. Um, I've heard a couple of different versions of what went on in, in the College of Commissioners. So I wanted to get your take on what really, really happened there. Uh, so version one is that Commissioner Ertinger was isolated and he was the only one who wanted uh, to, to slow down or give more time to the companies, uh, the automotive companies, to make the transition to, to clean energy cars. And then another version, which was put to me by Mr. Ertinger himself, was that there were six commissioners that actually uh, showed some sympathy or support for what he was saying on that point. Um, six out of the 21. <laughs> who's, who's telling me the truth? I think that, you know, I, uh, we, we have such a good agreement and for, for right causes that we shouldn't reveal the content on how we debate uh, these uh, things in, in the college. So I will, I will, I will stick with that. But, but what, what, was but, he alone or did he have uh, some friends? You don't have what, to put a number on. I think that uh, he was, uh, to be quite honest, he was not alone. But the degree of uh, uh, the support and uh, or the degree of, uh, um, I would say, the, 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 uh, the uh, concerns of, uh, of uh, some of the uh, colleagues been um, a very different one. Because I have to say that every single member of the college who intervened, his clear first statement was, we support the package, we see there's a balanced one. It's a high time. We are even maybe behind the schedule. Uh, we, ha we, we have, to, even if we are talking about the car industry, we have to catch the last train. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we see more taxi drivers in Brussels using Chinese electric BYDs, and mm -hmm. the teenagers would still believe that coolest car is Tesla. And that's definitely not what uh, we would like to see in Europe, where we invented the car, and we are proud of uh, uh, how our fleet uh, was, was perceived uh, internationally. So I would say that nobody questioned the ambition, nobody questioned the, uh, the, the strategic uh, direction which we wanted to, uh, to propose. The only discussion we have, uh, we have about intermediate uh, term and how much time the, the industry would have to adjust. But at the same time, I think my, my argument here, uh, it is that uh, this is the reason why we adopted this package in, in, in 2017. Mm -hmm. And I know uh, that uh, the, the car industry uh, is, is a very competitive one. They have uh, top class professionals and I'm sure that they will not uh, start to develop new models in 2021 to have them ready by 2025. Mm -hmm. I was in Frankfurt, uh, I was at this uh, biggest uh, electric uh, uh, motor shows in Germany and uh, I was shown 
and reassured by all European leading manufacturers that actually quite a few models is coming mm -hmm. uh, to the showrooms by 2019, 2020. And on top of it, and I will check that uh, personally, they promised me that these new electric uh, cars would be for the comparable price as a combustion engine price. Mm -hmm. I think because here we all have to do our bit. We have to improve the infrastructure in Europe. I would say the European Union and the member states uh, 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 together. But they also have to bring the, the, the models, fight for acceptance of these new models uh, uh, by, by the public, and also be, be very competitive. Mm -hmm. We will do everything we can uh, to help them to do so, but it must be really joint efforts because I think that our ambition in this segment should be pretty simple. We should, uh, we should really make sure that the, that the best cars are manufactured in Europe, that we put them on the number one infrastructure in the world, and that we uh, would do everything um, possible to be ready for the next stage, which would be not only electrical, but uh, autonomously driven, driven cars. That should be the vision. If you want to be number one in the world in this segment, I, I very much uh, support the vision of one of the CEO who presented as a triple zero, zero emissions, zero accidents, zero congestions. And this we can do if we have uh, clean cars, uh, well-connected cars, and if they are really driving on the, on the top-class infrastructure. That, those are some tough ambitions. Um, Mr. Galan, you look like you've got a question there. Do you have a question on that topic? Me? <laughs> See? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, well, I think it's uh, always it's a pleasure to have the opportunity of uh, hearing uh, the Vice President because he has already very clear ideas how to improve already the situation in Europe. I think he has already uh, mentioned something, but I think we are in the week of COP23. So I think you, you told me before, you've been in Bonn across the weekend, I was on Monday, and uh, in Bonn. And, uh, uh, and I think uh, it's true that very many countries, very many states, very many cities are doing things, it's going into action to try to change the trend of emissions. Uh, but uh, I think European Union is doing as well things. Uh, do you believe that in the current revision of ETS directive will be strong enough to reinforce the long-term carbon price signal or will be necessary to take further action for putting a price of carbon to those sectors which will not be included in the, in the ETS directive even if the numbers of uh, rights or, or allowances has been already withdrawn, will be enough to give already this clear signal. I was already in a round table with certain people in, in, in Bonn during the summit, and it was Professor, um, I remember this from Cambridge, uh, which was already saying that the, what is the, the level of price which will be necessary to achieve in order to, to switch from one technology to another one, uh, what is the level of uh, carbon prices will be necessary to electrify more the, the transport? Will be already the needs of investment. You mentioned infrastructure, the car. I, I'm sure I've been in the car industry for a while in my life as well. I completely agree with you about the quality of the engineers. We are able to make this thing in a short period of time. No doubt on that one. But I think uh, cars require infrastructure behind. Are the member states already in mind what this infrastructure will be needed? So uh, all, all these sort of things, that is the question I will pass to you. First, related to if it's enough, the reform of DTS for giving this signal. Second, will be necessary some more uh, uh, action to try to push the prices, the carbon up? And third, is enough uh, done at European level for providing infrastructures? And when I say infrastructure, it's not, it not only charges, it's charges in grid. Is the grid enough prepared for providing the power needed for charging millions of cars everywhere as they are today already with petrol station, et cetera, et cetera? That's my question. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will, I will, I will start from, 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 from the back. And here I have to say that we are, uh, of course, re relying on our great uh, European companies providing electricity uh, in Europe. And uh, it was, I, I have to say, very encouraging to see that uh, the EU electric and uh, Electricity providers have been very supportive of our clean mobility package. They, I would say, have been pushing us even for the higher and, and, and more, more ambitious goals. Of course, I would say the grids as we have them now, it will not be enough. That's, that's, that's quite clear. What we, and what we need to do, we just simply need uh, to proceed with the smartening of them. And, 
and Mr. Gala knows very well uh, how much you can benefit uh, if you use uh, better data mining, if you go for digitization of the grids, if you deploy the smart meters where they need to be deployed, uh, if we can um, kind of incorporate in our uh, future electricity trading model already that potential for electricity storage uh, represented uh, by this huge number of the batteries in our electric cars, which really offer us uh, that stabilizing factor in this intermittent world of, uh, of, of renewables. So it's quite clear that uh, we need uh, uh, to do it in parallel. Therefore, we started with a clean energy for all, reforming our electricity sector, pushing for modernization, for more modern ways of trading, and getting it ready for this revolution in a, in a clean mobility. Because by 2030, if we are very, let's say, conservative and we would stick um, to the goals which we set for ourselves, 27% uh, of energy generated by renewables. So it means that uh, over 70% uh, of the electricity in our grids uh, would be decarbonized uh, electricity. So we would have decarbonized uh, clean energy powering the, uh, the increasingly clean uh, fleet of the cars, where I hope by then uh, we will have uh, high quality green batteries manufactured in Europe because this is what we really need and that we would create this new ecosystem which will very well fit together because uh, more storage in electric cars would offer us to have more and more renewables in our electricity market. So smartening is a must, a modernizing of our uh, electricity, uh, electricity market is a must and, and therefore I hope that in the negotiations which are in the council and in the parliament we will not dilute uh, our proposal for the electricity market design. We see that there is a bit of a slowing down. I, I'm worried about some proposals which we put on the table and therefore also yesterday I was in the European Parliament meeting with the rapporteur, shadow rapporteurs, appealing to them to stick to the ambition because otherwise all that effort, uh, I don't want to say that it would go for Wayne, but would not deliver us that change, the transformative uh, um, so, so the pressure is to dilute, not to increase the target. Uh, I mean, if it comes to the electricity, uh, electricity uh, market design, so you have usually, I would say, several issues which are extremely sensitive. Regulated prices, mm -hmm. where we are, of course, uh, telling uh, to our counterparts in the member states that we uh, need to restore uh, uh, market signals. We, we have to have some movements of the, uh, of the, of the prices to bring the new investments and to really restore the, uh, the market operation in the electricity field. We're fully aware of the sensitive issues if it comes to households or vulnerable parts of the society, but we would prefer to do it in a targeted way to really help those who really need it. So uh, to simplify that we would not give the same subsidy uh, for the electricity to the guys who are heating up the swimming pools, then mm -hmm. those two really have a problem to pay for the, for the, for the energy bill. And that's possible. And in, in many countries, they do it. Ireland, lately, Lithuania, they uh, liberalized uh, already this part of the market. And as, as far as we can judge, I mean, it, it, it works. So that's one thing which is very sensitive. And second is, I would say, that a couple of questions linked with the capacity, uh, capacity mechanism, so-called European adequacy assessment, and uh, a, a lot of uh, um, uh, technical issues for, let's say, non-professionals, but which in the end still are carrying in themselves that priority of national outlook and how my energy system is performing and not kind of relying more on the cross-border cooperation on the region which you want yeah. to bring in because market coupling usually brings better results and better, better prices. And on the carbon price? I mean, on that's the complicated, but most people get it. If you have a higher price for carbon, it pushes the transition to the cleaner energy. I, I would say the, the, the current stage and then, then, then my, my personal vision. I think that uh, that reform which was adopted um, uh, last week was absolutely crucial and again it was not uh, easy negotiations. I think there have been several rounds that ended up at four o'clock in, in, in the morning. And what it really does that it's, I would say, almost mathematically uh, translates our ambition for 40% um, uh, reduction of greenhouse gas emissions from, from our system by 2030. So we adjusted the, the figures, we removed these 900 million allowances uh, 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 and put, the, put it into the market reserve. We adjusted the rate by which we would be removing the allowances from the market on the, on the annual basis. So we will definitely get to the minus 40% uh, uh, of the greenhouse gas emissions uh, thanks to the emission uh, trading scheme. 
You have uh, different estimates written in the press. We as a commissioner shouldn't, shouldn't speculate how much it would be because it's a market driven, uh, market driven mechanism. So clearly the carbon price would go, uh, would go uh, up. And uh, I still believe that uh, for some member states that would be not enough. This, we've been uh, hearing um, our French uh, friends asking uh, for more, the same was coming from, from different countries. So I wouldn't exclude that in some member states they would try to introduce something like the, the, like the carbon floor or mm -hmm. some other, uh, other incentives to really speed up the acceleration to the co low carbon emission. But at the same time, here at this uh, point of time, we wanted to have everyone on board, which we succeeded, even for those countries where it's politically very difficult and, and sensitive, it started with a lower, um, uh, lower starting position. And uh, I believe that in the end, Europe will uh, definitely in this respect would, would, uh, would do well. And once these new technologies will be m more on the market and more accepted, I believe that each country would see the transition to the, uh, to the decarbonized economy brings you a lot of revenues, a lot of positive results in modernizing. It's modernizing your economy. It uh, improves your environment. The young people are excited about it. So it has all these dividends, which you cannot simply spell out in, in, in euros. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, it brings this, uh, this, this new outlook for, for how modern your economy is. And mm -hmm. that would be, I think, the additional motivation for the transition. Mm -hmm. Now, I've got a question that my colleague Anka Gozu wanted me to ask you. So I hope I'm going to get it right. And it's about the renewables targets that the EU has set or is proposing, at the very least, in your clean energy package. Uh, so you've got, at the moment, the plan is for 27% renewables by 2030. But there are some in the parliament, at least, who want that higher and who argue that there are newer studies, that the original target was based on studies that are now out of date. Um, are we going to get to see those newer studies? Do you agree with that assessment? Can we make those targets stronger as it moves through the institutions? I think that 27% uh, um, um, target is... Uh, Achievable. I think that uh, when we've been debating uh, these targets and when we had that crucial meeting of the European uh, Council in October of 20, 2014, at that time it looked like extremely ambitious. And at that, at the, it was at that time when we still been uh, making this impact assessment, uh, which have been predicting that in 2030 we would pay 136 euros for a kilowatt hour from the offshore wind. Mm -hmm. And we saw the auctions this year, zero subsidies and a price which is competitive already today on, uh, on the market. So what I want to say is that the de development, I mean, in renewables uh, is, is already becoming exponential. Mm -hmm. So that the prices are going down, technology is, is, uh, is, is getting better. So that the problem we, which we have very often is not, uh, you know, the the price of ability to, to generate the renewable energy, but to transport it, like we see it from the northern Germany to Bavaria, or to, to, to store it, uh, because uh, that storage ability is, is not uh, adequate to that potential that the, the renewables bring. So you need to, to kind of adjust the, the, and smarten the, the whole energy sector so we can accommodate more of these uh, renewables. At the same time, what, uh, what I think uh, with renewables, again, I think we would have uh, 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 the target uh, uh, adopted at the level at least 27%, because otherwise you would reopen a lot of difficult discussions. But it would be, uh, it would be kind of a floor target, and I'm sure that, for, that many countries are well over it right now. And, uh, and I believe that uh, it would be the, the end results uh, for most of the EU member states, and in 2030 they will be most probably looking at this period and uh, I've been joking that at that time we probably couldn't have predicted the development but uh, that uh, the development was much faster because I think that here how now you know being from Slovakia we have to use the, the hockey you know <laughs> uh, hockey uh, comparison so we are at this uh, hockey stick curve at this breaking point where I really believe that in the next decade once we set right in the uh, this legal framework that the pickup of these technologies would be much faster than we can predict today. Great. Now, the question that's rising to the top on the Slido system is about air pollution, and that is a really topical issue because there's a protest today in Brussels uh, from two organizations who are protesting about the fact that in Belgium alone uh, they say there are 12,000 premature deaths every year as a result of air pollution. Um, I, I don't know exactly where that comes from, but if anyone has ever walked down Rue de la Loire, um, frankly, 
we could all be next on that list, probably. Um, so the question we've got here is active modes of transport are on the rise with huge potential to improve air quality in cities and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Is that part of Commission climate policy? Definitely so, because it's not only, it's not only the, the, the Brussels. I think that last winter was particularly uh, extreme. I mean, in the, in the air pollution, not only that we received, uh, I would say, enormous number of complaints from the citizens, from the, from the mayors, but we even have the days where several cities in Europe had uh, uh, worse um, uh, reading of the air pollution statistics than the, than the cities like Beijing and, mm. and Delhi. And this is something what nobody in Europe could have foreseen just a few years ago. So well, really, fact, Belgium turns off the monitors, so Brussels can't even <laughs> so, tell you how <laughs> they rate versus Beijing. But, uh, you know, we, we have rather uh, grim statistics on, uh, on this one, therefore, that uh, 2,000 premature death is, I think, it's a very realistic number, because for the whole Europe, that number is staggering uh, 400,000 premature deaths every year. And uh, that's uh, simply unacceptable with, the, with the, uh, today's technology. And, and I think that here, I, the, the, the public pressure and uh, the active mayors are actually doing enormous service to all of us because they're, they're, they're pushing the, the whole European establishment. They are, they're pushing all this, I would say, global uh, discussion um, forward on how important it is to tackle the, the air pollution, and I think that uh, the mayors have been really at the forefront of uh, actually, if I can, warning the car industry, do something with your, with your fleet because you will see more and more of the spread of the low emission zones, maybe some of these most polluted cars would be banned from entering the cities, and so simply you will have the, the car, but you can have it at home in the garage. And therefore, I think it's so important to, to kickstart uh, this, uh, this green mobility and to get these new models uh, on, on the roads because this is not only uh, the, the, the CO2 emission and climate change issue, this really affects our lives, it affects the health of our children, and it's really uh, becoming dangerous. And therefore, I think we have to be very, very responsible how we legislate, uh, how we take the decisions, and also hopefully how the European industry would uh, respond to this challenge. Mm -hmm. Now, a quick question about next week's State of the Energy Union scoreboard and report. Um, is there any hints you can drop for us about what's going to come out uh, there? I think that uh, I was trying to frame every year that what should be, you know, the, the word which would characterize it in the best way. At first, we had the year of delivery because we wanted to start the work on all those legislative proposals which we announced in our energy union strategy. Then, of course, it was very important to implement all, all those promises we've made. And, and the next year, what I feel is the most important, I would like, uh, from the point of view of energy union, uh, to have uh, 2018 as a year of engagement. Mm -hmm. What I mean by then, we need to really uh, work very intensively with our member states uh, to deliver on what will be the, this last but uh, very important piece of the puzzle, national energy and, and, and climate plans. Why do I dwell so much on this? Because I hear it from the investors, I hear, I hear it even from the, from, uh, from, the, from, the, from the common citizens that we very much like the Paris Agreement, we like what you do on the, on the EU level, this new European framework, but we would believe in it when I see that my government, that my country has very precise plan what they want to do between now and 2030, how they want to make sure that uh, in the second half of the century we would have a uh, carbon, carbon free uh, country. So you're going to be traveling a lot next year. I think we, we, we are, I am already in the, in the midst of the, of the uh, second uh, energy union tour, but I would also uh, 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 plea for, for, for the support because what we want to do is to get national parliament, social partners, uh, stakeholders, and citizens involved in. in conveying this message to the, to the member states that it's for the sake of these countries, it's for the sake of their citizens and, and, and their, their businesses to have this vision, this plan, because I believe it's a very important key to unlock mm -hmm. the investment flow coming uh, mm -hmm. to the country, because this is what I hear from these uh, financing groups, and, and I'm meeting a lot of them. I mean, I remember one particular uh, meeting, they came to my office and was uh, like a group of, uh, I would say, dozen uh, 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 business, uh, business representatives, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and they told me, we control the assets of 13 trillion euros. 
for somebody from Slovakia who don't know that so much money exists, 13 trillion euros. And we want to invest. We want to invest, I mean, this good project, energy efficiency, uh, green, uh, green technology. But we are still, you know, a little bit uh, uncertain. Would there be some reverse decision later on? Mm -hmm. uh, would you come again, uh, uh, um, uh, change the laws once we made uh, the investments? Uh, uh, what is our legal certainty? Where we will get that political clarity that what you do on the European level will really be respected on the national level and the national governments would support you. And therefore we need these national... Let's slow down the EU initiatives, focus on the national yes, implementation. Yes, but how you want to really implement all those uh, uh, European uh, um, goals and that European framework into very concrete national energy and climate. Mm -hmm. We try to make it easier for the member states, so we prepared the template. Mm -hmm. Fill up, you know, what do you want to do here, 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 here and there. If you cannot do it yourself, we are ready to help you. We can, uh, therefore, we uh, establish this structural reform uh, support service in the European Commission, so actually it shouldn't be such a difficult rocket science. Currently we have two-thirds of our member states who started the work, mm -hmm. one-third is hesitating, but my, uh, my, my dream would be uh, to complete uh, uh, this mandate with all that legislative proposals passed and adopted uh, and having 27 or 28 mm -hmm. national energy and climate plans on the table so we could see that we have uh, global uh, understanding, European consensus and, and national, uh, 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 national ambitions very well reflected mm -hmm. uh, in those very concrete plans. Great. Now for a fun moment where I give you a round of quick <laughs> questions where you have to answer in one word or, or one sentence, but I'll, I'll get you started on an easy one. What's your favorite wine? Red wine, I have to say. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Take the bait. You're supposed to tell me which country it's from. Yeah. You know, I see a lot of uh, wine representatives. And in this case. No, I, I think that in, in Europe we are blessed with, uh, with, uh, with uh, so, many, so many good wines. Uh, so okay, I, then I'll, I'll make it easier. Spanish or Italian wine? You have to choose one. <laughs> Looking, you know, across the table, I will say Spanish to the for this morning. You know? Good answer. Good answer. <laughs> Now, if you had to say who your closest friend in the College of Commissioners is, who would, who would you say? Closest friend, uh, yeah. uh, probably Viera Jourova, because, uh, you know, we can still chat in Czechoslovak. Uh -huh. So we have our secret language, which nobody can understand. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. What, what's the one place you never want to visit again for work? Oof, I would say the landfill, waste field in Kinshasa, Congo. Okay. That was a big project. Mm -hmm. It was the first thing I have seen when I landed in Kinshasa. And you see the kilometers and kilometers of the waste. And this was actually the managed mm -hmm. waste field, which was, uh, which was uh, financed and, and managed by the EU. And they told me that you don't want to see the fields which are not managed at all. So then I saw that, wow, that's a challenge. A huge country, a huge problem. Excellent. Sun or snow? Uh, I think definitely, uh, I think sun on the snow would be the best because okay. I love skiing <laughs> and, and true I love politician. <laughs> A true politician, everyone. Uh, and last one, uh, what's your favorite political TV show or movie? Saturday Night Live. Yeah. <laughs> Now, now I've got to take you back to the tough questions, I'm sorry. Um, we had a question on Brexit. It somehow disappeared off the screen. But they were asking, what do you think the right future relationship is between the EU and the UK? You know, I, um, my, 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 daughter's, uh, my daughter studied uh, in, uh, in, in London. She, she was working there. I was there very, very often just to see her and spend, spend the weekend with her. And I have to say that also because of this visit and talking to the tra taxi drivers, I was one of those uh, who was pessimistic on the, on the Brexit vote. I, I really thought that uh, Brits would leave, uh, Brits would vote to, to leave. That happened. I was not very happy that my, my, my prediction was, uh, was right. But that was unfortunately the, uh, the, the atmosphere. So what I want to say is that we, um, especially from, from Central uh, Europe, have a strong attachment to the, to the UK. They've been strong champion of enlargement. They, they speak English, which is a little bit easier for many of us than, uh, than French uh, or, or, or German. They've been, they've been very, uh, very, very, uh, very pragmatic and very often helpful. So, I mean, to see them leave such an important country uh, with all that uh, 
uh, tradition is, is very painful, is, is sad, and, and I think that I can honestly say that everyone around the college table and in our member states would like to have very, very meaningful and, and good relationship with the Brits. I mean, they are our neighbors, they will, they will always be here, and they always would be closest to us. Mm -hmm. So that's, and I would say so that... they're strong on the finance side as well, so you're going to yeah, need yeah. them at some level. Yeah, I, I think that that's, that's, I would say, that the overall, the, the overall uh, feeling, but at, at the same time, at, at this stage of the negotiations, I, I thought, knowing the high quality of British diplomats and how strong their foreign, uh, foreign service is, I thought that we would be almost wrapping up, you know, the uh, at least first part, and we'll be very in the middle of the second one, and we are not there yet. So I'm just uh, really worried that the current uh, state of the, of, the, of the negotiations will not, uh, will not allow us to move forward. We still have a few days to go before the... Uh, December European Council, and, and I just hope that we can prevent the situation where uh, we would end up uh, this uh, stage, some kind of disarray, we would have to go through a kind of a crisis, and only after that we realize that the problem is really mm -hmm. a very serious one, and we have to negotiate in, 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 in earnest. So I definitely would be uh, for the for the fair deal, uh, which would keep us as, as close as possible. But in this case, I think uh, really uh, our British friends would have to tell us uh, how they picture that, uh, how they want to do it, and I'm sure that they will find a listening partner on the other side of the table. But at the same time, they also have to respect that uh, we have our priorities, that for us the, uh, the unity and the future of the European project is absolutely sacred, and that we are ready to do anything to make sure that uh, EU 27 would perform well, that we, we, we will have our global, uh, uh, global ambition, a global future, and we want to be a global player. Mm -hmm. Now, we've got one very popular question that we really need to, to ask you uh, from the European Biogas Association. And they ask, do you consider renewable gas and biogas as sustainable solutions for the future? For I the same votes. Can't yeah. get more popular than that. I think that, uh, of course, if it comes uh, uh, to, to biogas and um, and to, uh, I would say, uh, advanced, uh, advanced uh, uh, biofuels. Uh, I think that we very much recognize the, the, the potential of these fuels in uh, cutting the greenhouse uh, uh, gas emission very significantly. But of course, each biogas is a little bit different. It depends on the technology, how you mix it, uh, what is required into a generation of the, uh, of the biogas. And, and therefore, we, we pushed very much for this new advanced, uh, um, uh, advanced level of, uh, uh, of biofuels because that's a little more complicated than just uh, make them from let's simplify it from the crop type of a, mm -hmm. uh, 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 products. So uh, biogas can really help us to, to reduce the greenhouse gas emission, but in this case, what we do here is that we, we deal with these issues in, uh, the, in the fuel directives. So therefore, we are trying to deal with, uh, I would say, the sources of energy and the reform of energy sector in one directive, and if it comes to the fuels uh, with another one. Now, one final question, because we are running out of time. So it's a question on the home front. Uh, you're from Slovakia, and you're now the equal longer serving commissioner <laughs> as well, I might add. And we've seen in the last few weeks and months a real sort of re-engagement by the Slovak government uh, with Brussels. So some of the rhetoric has been dialed down. Uh, people have been going to Slovakia for visits. There's been a much more positive dynamic. What's your sense of what's behind it? And maybe you're actually the reason that the attitude's changing. I, to, to give us a bit of an insight in, yeah, into that. It would be really an uh, overstatement. But I think what, what has happened was that I would say that uh, political debate in Europe triggered by, by Brexit, by, uh, by US elections, by all that uh, worries we all had when we saw the, how the elections been moving from the country to the country, and, and, and you saw how the potential for extremism is, is growing across uh, uh, the Europe. That debate, which was uh, generated in Bratislava, at the Bratislava summit, which was actually the first time the leaders met uh, uh, without UK prime ministers, and when uh, the one clear conclusion was uh, we go forward and we are going to work on our uh, unity, and until today we are working on so-called Bratislava roadmap, even in the, in, in the commission, it started the, the discussion about how the Europe would evolve 
what would be the primary areas of the closer uh, integration, and even though the institutional role of the Commission is to push the good solutions for all 27, mm -hmm. it was very obvious that if it comes to the concrete policies, uh, European prosecutor, um, uh, PESCO, or later on the Schengen and the Euro, you have different enthusiasm in different member states. And therefore, I mean, this generated also a very strong public debate in, into the Slovakia, and I'm very glad that I think two weeks ago, the President, Prime Minister, and the Speaker of the Parliament, uh, three top uh, representatives of, of my country, all, all of them from different political parties, clearly stated uh, that we support the EU, we are pro-EU and we want to be in the core EU. Yeah, they and, really said and, we're mainstream. And, and that a little bit distinguishes them um, from the atmosphere in other uh, Visegrad for country. And, and they are not very shy about it. I mean, these are the neighbors, uh, neighbors of Slovakia. So I know that the debates around the table are, are, are very frank. And sometimes when they are adopting the common position, it, it takes for four hours to, to agree. But, uh, I mean, in, in this case, I think Slovakia is very clearly uh, uh, pro-European country because it's only one in, in the Eurozone and wants to see uh, the European Union to be very, very successful. I think that was the message of the uh, president who for the first time visited yesterday the, the European Parliament and, and, and to say that, I mean, for me, uh, as, a, as a commissioner from this country, it's of course, it's a pleasure and it's much, much easier for me to be from the country which is so clearly pro-European than for, for, for some other colleagues who have to struggle a, a little bit to, to explain how and why the EU is so important for their concrete member states. Well, you've done a great job explaining your views today, Vice President Sefcovic. A round of applause. Thank you Thank very you. much for Thank joining us. Thank you very much. <laughs> And a, a final word before you all head off to work. A thank you to our partner, Iberdrola. It's been a great event, and we couldn't have done it without you. Uh, thank you to everyone who watched online. And remember those evaluation forms. It just takes 30 seconds to tick a few boxes or write one comment. So please take them with you and drop them in the box on the way out. And now um, we wish you a great day. And if you want to stick around for some networking, please do. But otherwise, we'll see you at the next Playbook event, which is next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you. <laughs> That's great. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks.